on this episode of Indiana Education Insight. We try to delve into uh, the issues that uh, we think are important uh, for people in education uh, that might not be uh, important to the general, you know, steel worker uh, who reads the, the local newspaper. Uh, so we try to um, tell people, uh, you know, what's going to happen and why the decisions were made and um, how it all fits together. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a passion for uh, journalism and um and uh, hard-hitting reporting and high-impact reporting. Every week, the Indiana Association of Public School Superintendents is taking you inside today's Indiana Education Collaboration and tomorrow's education trends. We're staying on the pulse of public school innovators throughout Indiana and beyond. Join our conversation and contribute to our upcoming topics at iapssin.org slash podcast. Here's your host, Dr. J.T. Koopman. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Indiana Education Insight. I'm Dr. J.D. Koopman, Executive Director of the IEPSS. This podcast is being delivered by our IEPSS team and produced by our friends at Edge Media Studios. As Executive Director of IEPSS, I'm excited to bring you this weekly show where we feature Indiana education innovators from all over our great state, from students to superintendents. We'll also be talking to higher education leaders and educators at the state level as we work together as proactive public education advocates. That's why IPS is here and why we are proud to bring you this show. Every week, we're talking about trending topics in the public education space while bringing in Indiana education innovators to hear from their perspective. As with any organization, it takes great leadership to be successful, and that is one of the main missions of IEPSS, developing great school district leaders. It is always great to have experienced and passionate educators joining the show, so let's get started with today's conversation. Topics and Trends in Indiana Education. I'm excited to bring you today's guest, Mr. Adam Von Osdell, uh, Senior Editor with Head & News Service. As well as numerous public speaking uh, engagements, he's been instrumental in shaping the conversation about Indiana public school news and policy, and has the ability to look at education from various lenses, which is very important. Of course, he has been a tremendous asset to public education in Indiana, Let's find out how he views these issues in Indiana public schools. Welcome, Mr. Van Osdal. Uh, We are absolutely excited to have you with us today. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got involved with Hannah News Services? Great. Uh, Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Uh, I've been uh, actually been in this position since 2005. Uh, So I've seen a lot happen and can come and go in uh, education policy at the state level. Uh, but for someone like myself who um, has a passion for for journalism, um, it's a great place to work because there's really never a shortage of things to write about. Absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we appreciate what you do and uh, the information that you produce on on behalf of education. Um, how did you get started uh, writing about education and state government? Uh, I uh, went to Indiana University to study journalism, uh, worked for the student newspaper there, uh, came up to Indianapolis uh, a couple times uh, mm-hmm. and met some people. And uh, the position opened up right as I graduated from college. So the timing worked out well. And I just kind of networked myself into into working for the newsletter. I'd never heard of the publication before. Uh, you know, most people haven't heard of it unless they subscribe to it. Sure. Um, but uh, I just think it does a great job of uh, telling people what's right. going to happen and yeah. helping people understand the decisions that are made. And One of the nice things about coming from the IU campus and especially working with their student news uh, paper, they were always very active in seeking out information about the schools and the local things that were happening in addition to, to the IU uh, news and happening. So you had a great background. That's a great training ground. It's it's a really good thing they've got going there. Absolutely. They really do. Um, <clears throat> so, um, how has the newsletter changed uh, since it was acquired by Hannah News Services? Yeah, so Hannah's kind of come in and kind of reinvigorated things a little bit. 
Uh, we got a new masthead. Uh, we've got advertisements for the first time. Uh, we've got a new website. Um, we're just kind of in a growth stage right now, thinking of some different uh, products that we can do. We spend a lot of time thinking about um, you know, what we can do well um, that other publications um, don't do or don't have the time to do. And so we're not a mass, um, we're not a mass uh, audience uh, publication. Right. You know, we got a very you know, s- small niche of people who are sure. into education who already know a lot about education, but just want some help uh, tracking everything that goes on at the state, the local level, state level, um, and all the uh, policies, uh, decisions that are made. Right. Now, there's, there's actually two of those newsletters. Can you tell us what those two newsletters are and what their specific niches look like and how they're different? Yeah, good question. So we have our flagship newsletter, which is the Indiana Legislative Insight. That comes out once a week. And then we have Education Insight, which is every other week. And we also have an Indiana Gaming Insight, which covers the casinos, uh, the horse tracks, the lottery, okay. and now uh, sports betting as well. Okay. I wasn't aware of that one, so that was a new one on me. Yeah, so I spend uh, probably about 25% of my, my job actually writing for that one. Okay, well, that's interesting. It's kind of an interesting mix of topics there, education well, and gaming. Especially given some of the conversations that were happening in this last legislative session around uh, one of the casinos relocating. That, that had to be uh, very insightful for you. Fa- yeah, fascinating top, fascinating time, uh, some of the changes that are going on. Uh, some of the biggest changes that they've had in the 20 some years that we've had had gaming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Is it frustrating not to have uh, a byline um, as the author of this newsletter? Uh, Yes and no. I mean, it it gives me a little bit of cover where, um, you know, I don't have to, um, you know, necessarily have everyone on the record all the time about uh, certain things. So people might, be a little bit more relaxed and free to talk about what's really going on, which is a benefit to the readers. Sure. Yeah. Um, So. Specifically, just so that I better understand the difference uh, with a byline as you as the author versus not having a byline. What does that mean? Yeah, so it doesn't say by Adam Van Osdell in the newsletter, but nor does it say by anyone. Yeah. Um, there's really no author listed. Right, right. Okay, so that's what a byline is, is, is by whoever writes the particular article. So that's what we would typically see in a, let's say, an Indianapolis Star. Exactly. Okay, all right. Well, I didn't really know that, so maybe that'll be informative for our audience as well. Um, <clears throat> so um, what, what does a typical day look like for you? Are you scheduled with appointments? Do you go seek news, or does the news come to you? Well, I'd love it if the news came to me all the time. Uh, that's kind of a journalist dream when people come to you and say, hey, write about this. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it starts out, especially when the legislature's in session, as you know, 8.30 a.m. committee meetings are the norm in the House. Yep. And those might go till noon, and then you might get a short break, and then, you know... It, there's usually even there's several committees going at the same time and yeah. you're trying to juggle those. Yeah. But um, and then in the, in the afternoon, if the General Assembly is in the session, they might go into caucus. So then you're ended up waiting around for a while mm-hmm. while they do their thing. But I do spend a lot of time chasing stories and, uh, you know, a lot of times those dead end and don't end up in, in any kind of story whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And, and while you're doing that, you know, we might get a press release from the governor's office about some breaking news. And so you have to be flexible and nimble to drop everything you're doing and uh, go pick up something else completely different. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think, like I said, it's, there's no shortage of things to write about. You know, I'm writing about the State Board of Education and the, the Charter School Board and the Education Employment Relations Board and the public retirement system sometimes, the bond bank, the finance authority, uh, the state finance board, the budget committee, on and on. You know, right. There's tons of stuff going on all the time. And trying to see the big picture of how it all fits together is, I think, what we do really well. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, now we have the new governor's workforce cabinet, which is another entirely new element for you to be thinking about and covering, I would assume. Yes, yes, yes. So that's only been around for, what, a year and a half, maybe. So they're still trying to find their way, too. But that's 
becoming the center of a lot of education policy making. Well, and, and then when we have an appointed uh, Secretary of Education that will be working with the state board, that will be working with the governor's cabinet, the dynamics in education are going to change dramatically. Do you think that uh, Jennifer is going to be uh, involved in the election at all, of uh, directing people to who to vote for and, and what's important? Um, I, she has a, a passion and a voice for public education, and I think she's going to use that voice uh, to promote that agenda. Yes, I do. Uh, now, as far as the Secretary of Education goes, you know, obviously she won't have any say-so about that. Um, because that'll be the governor and, and probably uh, the leaders in both houses that will probably have that conversation. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting times. And it will give you a lot of fodder <laughs> <laughs> to, to report on. So how do you squeeze so much news and information into each issue? Because they are jam-packed with really good information. So I have uh, a lot of help with my... Uh, you know, my boss is, since I've started it, the guy who hired me is Ed Feigenbaum. Mm -hmm. um, a legend. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. He, um, you know, one of the things he does, he scours uh, the newspapers and the media all across the state every day and he shares those stories with me as they pertain to education. So uh, that's how we get a lot of our uh, information. Right. Um, and then, I mean, we're literally seeking out sources all the time from everything and everywhere we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible but then also on the stuff that we think is really most important we try to go really into in depth on it as well mm -hmm. do, do in-depth gritty coverage of right. committee meetings or certain policy debates so we try to combine breadth and depth it's you know challenging but you know we don't there's no one else doing it and so we take it seriously that we oh. want to do it as well as, and, as we can and greatly appreciate that so you know it it seems to me that uh, at least from my limited exposure and perspective is that we have a very active education news reporting in the northwest times which is in the merrillville area we have very active reporting and education news in fort wayne but I don't see that necessarily being active in other parts of the state. Would you agree or disagree with that? Uh, it does seem that there are a lot of dark spots where you don't hear anything about uh, education coverage. You know, there are some school districts I haven't written anything about in, in a long time. And yeah. I, I go to their website to see if they post their board meetings. Um, some do, some, some have board docs and, and they're fully transparent, mm -hmm. you know, which I greatly appreciate. Yep. But others, you don't, you know, they don't even tell you when they're meeting. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. interesting. Huh. Well, um, that was just my perspective from, like I said, my limited exposure. You're, you're much more uh, out there seeking that kind of information. Um, so what stories, if any, are you working on right now? What, what kind of things can we expect uh, here? in the next couple of editions? Uh, I do think the governor's workforce cabinet is uh, an entity that I'm going to be looking into and trying to figure out what um, they've been doing uh, and what they're likely to do as well. Um, I think they've been doing a lot that hasn't really been reported on that I'd like to, um, that I do plan to write about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how the governor, whoever the next governor is, structures the Indiana Department of Education. Um, not just who they hire, but how they organize it and how it um, interfaces or interacts with the state board mm -hmm. and, um, and the workforce cabinet now, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to what you're reporting and, and what you see because I have my, <clears throat> my own feelings in, in relationship to what I'm seeing or not seeing. Uh, of course, one of the big topics of conversation that I'm sure you're covering is the fact that we've got this uh, uh, teacher salary and shortage study committee working and uh, that's basically staffed by business people as opposed to educators which I found to be interesting. Yeah that's that's a running theme of uh, the past two or three governors is uh, you know business-led uh, reforms. Um, having business people at the seat of the table making the decisions, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, 
you know that's that's their that they're they they do not shy away from the fact that that is what they want to see happen oh so absolutely and it's you know you kind of it's things are circuit uh, circular too. things that they talked about 10 years ago come back and you know mm-hmm. like that's what i see i kind of see this as a government efficiency type exercise which was something that um you know mitch daniels was uh, had several government efficiency commissions in his time yeah and I, do you see that as this agency too they're trying to figure out how they can make local schools more efficient to drive more money because i no one's i don't see them talking about actually giving them more money it's it's spending the money that they do have better quote well um that that's a probably another conversation <laughs> for another time that i would love to have with you um and my school district, when I was a superintendent, we were part of that government efficiency panel, if you will. And we went in front of those individuals that were on that government efficiency study committee. And uh, the outcome of that, and I was told verbally, you guys do a great job of being efficient with all of your cooperative purchasing and, and banding things together and, and buying things in bulk and on and on and on. He said, you're probably doing a better job than most businesses are. So I was kind of glad to hear that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so that report just kind of died on the vine and, and really didn't go anywhere. Um, and school districts are even more efficient today than they were back then. So I don't know what they're looking for or what they're expecting. Um, you know, we've got... Uh, talking about efficiency, we have a state board of education, we have a department of education, now we have a new workforce cabinet th- through the governor's office. And those things didn't exist before, so I don't know where that efficiency conversation ends and begins, but that might be one area. And, <laughs> and, and that might be once the new uh, department of education com- comes on board and the secretary of education, there might be a streamlining of those things, you know. At the very least, schools will be probably be getting a, a coordinated message of, of, of what to do. So you don't have these situations at the State Board of Education where attorneys from DOE and attorneys from, from the State Board are giving different opinions and directives to the, to the members of the State Board and, and sending out each their own memo to the field about, about what to do, which we, we've sort of seen with the, uh, the, the teacher professional growth points. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. That is at least one thing to look forward to. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would also agree with your consensus in relationship to mixed messages coming out of both of those places. <laughs> um, so uh, what are some of the big stories that we can uh, uh, that, that we saw in, in the last year? And what kind of big stories are you anticipating coming in the next year? Well, it was another big session for education and the General Assembly. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, you know, now that the laws were passed, the regulations and policies have to be implemented by the executive branch. So that's an ongoing topic to, right. to cover about. Um, and that's really a behind the, a really behind the scenes thing too, where, so, that, you know, journalism, it's our publication again, helps shed some light on some of that stuff that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in, in higher education, I know the Commission for Higher Education is going to be coming out with a new strategic plan uh, for all the state universities. So uh, that may be interesting, too. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, <clears throat> and, and probably another conversation for another time. Um, you know, since you see this kind of up close and personally, do you, do you have any... Uh, attributes that you could assign to why Indiana and other states for that matter are having such a teacher shortage. Do you have any insight into that? I mean, uh, it's, it, uh, I guess for one thing that's, it, it's a, it's a full, a full, a full employment economy, you know, so it's not just teachers. It, there's a shortage of truck drivers, there's a shortage of welders, and, you know, construction seen, trades, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. It's, we, can, we can go on and on in relationship to employment shortages. Sure. So. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, since this is primarily a, an education audience, uh, why don't you tell our audience why they should subscribe to these publications? 
Well, we try to delve into uh, the issues that uh, we think are important uh, for people in education uh, that might not be uh, important to the general, you know, steel worker uh, who reads the, the local newspaper. Uh, so we try to um, tell people, uh, you know, what's going to happen and why the decisions were made and um, how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a passion for uh, journalism and um and uh, hard-hitting reporting and high-impact reporting. So, uh, you know, I think people are going to uh, learn a lot um, and uh, and be uh, find it helpful. Sure, sure. Um, there's a couple of other things that kind of come to mind in in relationship to why I think it's important for educators to subscribe to this. The the information that I glean when I read both of these publications. I don't read the gaming publication because I have no need to do so. Um, but I always learn something new about something I wasn't aware of going on that you report on. And I think that's an important aspect of trying to stay current, uh, especially as educational leaders for the things that we need to know and be aware of. So I appreciate what you report on. And I do believe that all of our educators should subscribe to these publications. So. I'm on your bandwagon, for Thank sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for the endorsement. Absolutely. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to add um, and share with our educational leaders that might be listening to this podcast? No, nothing comes to mind. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to encourage them to subscribe. And as you know, we are um, a supporter uh, in the Education Insight uh, newsletter and we sponsor that and and we're not sponsor we're partial sponsor for that and and i will continue to do that because i think it's important that educational leaders take the lead on information that is being put out specifically as it applies to public schools so thank you and, and i will continue to endorse you as well um, so i would like to uh, thank mr van osdell for being our guest on ipss's edition of indiana education insight now, it is time to wrap up this episode with my take on the current state of affairs in Indiana education landscape. Dr. JT's closing comments. Due to the complex issues associated with school reform, we need to engage our communities and have them help us develop the portrait of a graduate. And as such, the program is important as the final product and we need to have our community engaged in that dialogue. We have so many educational issues requiring our attention, such as early childhood education, appropriate assessments, the teacher shortage, teacher pay, professional development, school security resources, uh, privatizing charter schools, vouchers, uh, private schools. Our communities and parents need to be engaged and see how they can change the dialogue. With so much of the focus on the teacher shortage due to low pay, could we not shift the funding from a meaningless assessment system costing $100 million into the classrooms and pay teachers more? Through this public dialogue, it is my hope that we can get the legislators and our state leaders to see the value of public schools and the nexus of promoting public schools as an economic development tool in our Hoosier states and communities. I see these invest as investments in our children and in our state, not necessarily as an expenditure. So uh, perhaps we can pursue this issue and others on our next segment. On our next show in August, our guest uh, will be Carol Griffin uh, with the Indiana Teachers Credit Union. And I'm sure that uh, our guest will provide some additional insight into the State House and education. Join us that, for that and more on the next in the Insight into Indiana Education. Thanks for being part of education. Please stand up for Indiana Public Schools.